Thank you. Um, you know, in, in a sense, the um, I, I think the basis of the discussion needs to be kind of a combination of what Peter Berger said and what Alan Siegel mm -hmm. said. That is, how do we, you know, I mean, the other papers were very interesting, excellent in their own ways, but if we're here to discuss this text and its canonical role, then we kind of come back to those uh, those discussions. And, you know, the question that I had, uh, and I read uh, Social Construction and Reality, uh, you know, a few years after, it probably about 1971, 72, uh, is why was there no uh, child of uh, social construction of reality, particularly by these authors? Mm -hmm. um, and how was it, and Alan kind of challenges us with this, you know, how is it that the book becomes used and takes a life of its own, whether it's a Frankenstein life or something uh, that is more uh, more amenable to our own self evaluations So and, and that was that's the kind of thoughts that happened. I don't to speak to you about. Any so maybe let Alan. You know, I, I would Alan like to hear question. Alan left. What? Oh, Alan and, left. <laughs> he abandoned us. <laughs> oh. Who will challenge? Kevin Barr has a response. Oh, okay. Or a question. Uh, no, it's not a question, and it's it's a kind of a response. I just wanted to say it's an analogy. Uh, I find what you raised is a very interesting question, and I've had the same question about frame analysis. Why is it that it has become again the way that it's used, like people in social movements and so on? It's basically, so you always say Goffman 1974, do you know that anyone ever read this? Do you know that anyone ever read Bateson? And, you know, well, I, I mean, I can talk about that. I mean, that's, that's but it's what, a, what happens with frame analysis is that you have Bill Gamson taking frame analysis and then in the book with Rutina and, and Fireman, you know, uh, react, what is it, unjust, responses to unjust authority in 82, they begin to make that change from the phenomenology of frames. And then David Snow, and, and I love David, God bless him, but he, he looks, he has an entirely different non-phenomenological view of frames. I mean, his, his social movement's view is to treat frames as kind of obdurate uh, narrative realities. So, so, so um, what Buckman and Berger would say the same thing happened to them. That, that, that I, I think there are two parts of your question. One is um, why is it that the book didn't become uh, the basis for uh, a real intellectual development on its own terms? And w what we have there is, is the title became the basis of an intellectual development, but not the actual Right. Work. Well, and the title though though is I would point out to that, that a number, uh, yes, the title is connected to the Except every word in the title is taken very seriously by the authors. So it's the social construction of reality. It's not the social construction of non reality, it's not the social construction of the illusion of reality. It's the social construction of reality, and it's a very careful analysis of how it is that human beings create their world. But it is their world, and it has, in the argument, it has an objectivity. And I would also. And I, I just want to make a tribute to, to the presenters, because the presenters actually took the work seriously. And I think that a lot of people take the ideas seriously, even if they don't label themselves as being part of the school. So I, I know Evitar's work very, very well, and, uh, and not as well the other, the other contributors. And it's clear, you know, when, when Evitar announced to us that this was a crucial book in his intellectual trajectory, that, that it was crucial to his work, you know, you can read Evitar's work and you read the book closely, and there it is. Uh, he has teachers 
and they wrote a book together. Now, why the people who wrote it? Another part of your question is why did the teachers not take their own work so seriously? So, so you know, one thing I think is quite notable <coughs> is that what uh, uh, Peter presented to us today uh, has is a far distance from uh, the text uh, that we're commemorating, celebrating. And uh, arguably that's true of Luckman too, though I think it's less true of Luckman. I think Luckman stayed closer to those ideas. Yes? So I, I, I want to respond to this, but I also didn't make my real response to Gary. The response to this is that it goes back I first met Peter Berger in 83, and we talked about, he, he was interested in talking about capitalism in Southeast Asia, right. and I wanted to talk about construction of reality, and he was totally uninterested in right. that right. back then. But my response to you, Gary, about uh, you know how come he didn't make the kind of impact that you'd expect and so on, I think it's part of it. It's a very unique book in the sense that, you know, I call it in my paper a soup-like blend of this one, this one, this one, and that one. To bring together in the same book, to be heavily Durkheimian, heavily Marxian, even though they don't recognize it, heavily Median, on top of all that shoot, and Mannheim too, this is something that is unprecedented, and it's not something, you know, at the time, you know, I was an undergraduate in the, la in the late 60s. You know, it seemed as if the world of sociology is all about Parsons and Martin. And there's functionalism, and, and then there is Marxism, and so on. And there's also symbolic interactionism. And there is symbolic interactionism, but, but, but they are totally separate. To, and, and Durkheim, for me, was a bad word, because it was associated with the functionalism. To be able to see the quote-unquote objective reality from a Durkheimian standpoint, and the internalization from the media. That in itself, without Marx, without Schultz, an amazing thing. I think that in our profession, I think it's in academia in general, but I don't know much about other academia. I know about sociology. There's a great liking for boxes, right. isms, mm -hmm. and this kind of theory, this kind. You know, I've been teaching theory for 35 years, I've been very troubled by the fact that one of the greatest geniuses, maybe the greatest genius that we had in the discipline, Georg Zimmel, mm -hmm. was not considered in a lot of theory books because it didn't fit any any of the any of the boxes. So I think that what they did was introduce something very I'll say again, a soup like blend and blends are not appreciated in our profession. Anyone else? I also think the book was not appreciated because it was written too well. <laughs> and and too remember well. that in, in the subtitle, it is a treatise. Right. And how many treatises are there? I mean, it's, right. that's a very specific kind of discourse that is, you know, Gottman never wrote a treatise. Uh, you know, Zimmel never wrote a treatise. Uh, it, is, it is that particular kind of blending that Evie occurs. At the same time, I think that not only the book was abandoned by the authors, right? right? That they moved directly to religion, and not all the readers of the Sosolio uh, knowledge book were, were interested in the problems that became so important about the visibility of religion by Lockman or the uh, development and religion with barriers. So probably there was like a public waiting for more than that other book in that line never, never came out. I mean, it seems to me that it's also the case that it provides, the, the treatise provides a kind of skeleton that then in, in sort of motivates us to go out and watch. Let's go watch how reality is produced, right? Mm -hmm. Let's go see it. Um, I'm not sure they felt they needed another treatise or that they needed more elaboration on the skeleton that they had provided in this very slim book. I mean, this is, I don't remember exactly how many, but 150 something pages. <laughs> uh, so it seems to me the follow-up is empirical work of showing how reality is produced. Um, and I think there's lots of that. They, they've done some of that. You know, we've all done that too. Good job.
Yeah, I mean, just to follow up on this, I think also, and um, to members of the committee on the right, my right, uh, with something to say about it is that cognitive sociology also, in a way, uh, took up some of the questions that Berger and Lockman delineated in the kind of practical mechanisms to which we sort things and kind of make them, take them for granted, right? I mean, I don't know if that's an opinion you share. Or so I, mean, I agree. I agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, I, I see lots and lots of cognitive stuff in, in the book that has since been more the, the, the book also, The Social Construction of Reality, uh, also has a very, reading it has a very shocking experience. Which I found when teaching it similar to a presentation of self in everyday life. It's shocking because if you really if you really understand the message there, it's a very scary message. Uh, and I, I think that a lot elaborate. of people elaborate. So a former <laughs> student, I remember Joanna Foster, after we discussed in class uh, sort of fact of reality, she came to my office kind of very pale. She said, I feel that it's as if the rug was pulled from underneath me, as if there's nothing to stand on. And there's something very similar in the work of Garfinkel. Garfinkel pulls the rug also in his idea of methodology, and notice that very soon afterwards, that what, was, what is being called ethnomethodology was not what he tried to do, but actually taking the tool which is studying conversation making it into conversational analysis, which is a very different thing. But the phenomenologically troubling thing about you know, what kind of world is it that we take for granted? What is this taking for granted? You know, I'm working now on taking for grantedness, and I don't see sociologists having worked on that. Since Schultz and Garfinkel, yeah. Yes. <coughs> Coming from the field of the history of medicine, <clears throat> the book was very influential for desensitizing the body, though they don't talk about the body. So that's interesting also in terms of the itinerary of the, of the book through different disciplines. So, so for us, essentializing was biology, so the social construction, construction of reality was a way of approaching the body as something that has to do with society and culture. So that was really key in our field. Though they don't talk about the body, which is also interesting. <laughs> yeah, I mean I, I completely I completely agree with what you've just said and that's a lot of how I have used the text and the ideas of the text in my own work was to think about how we can understand the social construction of the body. And for me specifically I'm interested in um, the mechanisms or the processes, right, trying to get to that level of, of granularity. Um, and, and for me, the text has been very helpful in thinking about both cognitively and perceptually what happens when we, when we socially construct the body. How can we understand it from those two perspectives? It seems to me that one of the things that um, this is not going to directly follow up with the body question. Um, Although the body question, I think, in part raises how Berger and Lefman may have been brought into broader fields in a way that they don't appreciate. <laughs> um, in the sense that I think that what they're, um, what they're, you know, reading through this book again, it's very clear that for them, it's not as if the reality that we take for granted just sort of doesn't exist or it's pure ephemera. Right? But it's been built in such a way, and if you look at how it's been built in such a way, it makes it clear that it didn't have to be this way and it could always be something else, right? That doesn't mean that we just flip the switch <laughs> and turn into anything that we want, right? Because we recognize that it's been built. Um, so I think in some sense the social construction of <laughs> the body and gender in sort of um, misses that misses that point, or did miss that point for a, a fair amount of time in its attempt to kind of open up the, the structure of possibilities. Um, 
that wasn't actually the point I was going to start with, but I forgot what my opinion well, in, was. Well, in many ways, I think that the social constructionism, yeah, as you said, is sort of a foundationalist kind of view, where there's something, where there's still something there. Right. It's right. not, um, and and for gender scholars, um, you know, that was problematic in some ways. Right. And so the, there's a tension between those, those two viewpoints. And in my in my own work, I try to reconcile right this foundationalist view with the social construction of gender in a more radical radical sense by thinking about the social construction of the body um, perceptually as attention and disattention, which I felt allowed for materiality, but at the same time, social construction and interpretation. Is that it? Can't <laughs> <laughs> what, what about you, you guys commenting on each other? <laughs> I, I, I want to comment actually on uh, your concept of less real. Uh, I wish you would put quotation marks because <laughs> it really it really goes against the whole point of what Schultz has in mind about multiple realities. It's not that one of them is more real, it's more real in a social way because of how we see that every day. I tried very hard not to use quotation marks. <laughs> I'm trying very hard to do that. But you, but you see the danger yep. in your readers seeing this as essentializing reality, social reality is reality. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's you know, precisely not what I'm interested in. You know, Robin, Robin Williams has a fantastic quotation. He says, reality, what a concept. <laughs> <laughs> I think that you brought that the Bruno Latour sort of stuff, but in kind of very different ways. I think you, if I understood well, your comment towards the end of your presentation was kind of uh, critical towards it, uh, while uh, Steve was, uh, I think, uh, well, trying to incorporate the two of them. Uh, but I don't know if I'm right about your, your position. Uh, I just wanted to make the point that um, the concepts that come together in the social construction of reality are really very broad, also very different sociological schools, what we talked about in the beginning of this discussion here. So it's Durkheim, Viva, Schutz, Marx, whatever. And um, I found it very fruitful for my work on the sociology of architecture to have all these different perspectives and they build it together in a way that it that they communicate with each other. This, um, different approaches. And this is very fruitful for thinking about architecture. And the critical comment was just that I think that um, a and <coughs> is a little more narrow. And um, But I think it's also great um, with the social construction of reality is that you can understand how these other approaches like a and fit into the social construction of architecture. So it helps helps me understanding where the A and T position comes from and mm -hmm. how to interpret it. Yes. Um, I wanted to raise two points which are a little to, louder. Uh, to be crucial, um, if you try to, to use this conception of social construction or I don't know to, how to name it after learning that is all stable, but um, I think the issue of contingency is, is very important because uh, things can be constructed, but it may be necessary that uh, they are constructed in a certain way. So uh, then pointing out that it's constructed doesn't mean that it's contingent. If you read uh, Kant's book, uh, the, the Critique of Pure Reason, he says that our conception of reality is constru constructed, but it's not contingent. It has to be this way. So um, pointing out that something is constructed does not necessarily imply that it's contingent, and you have to show that. So um, I think if you, for example, say that capitalism is socially constructed, it may even be necessary, even though it's um, socially constructed. So sociologists some, sometimes seem to forget that, that you have to show that it's contingent. And the second point is that it's not normative critique that it's socially constructed, because everything is socially constructed. And sometimes people think that it's, it's a better critique of, of nationalism to find out that nations are socially constructed. And it's true, but that it doesn't show that they are bad. So what I'm trying to say is not that it's 
it's forced upon it or that it's only one step and then you have to show that it's contingent and that it's bad. And um, people often take the shortcut and just, just say it's socially constructed, but it's not really Seems to be you should have something to say. <laughs> no, 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 I have yeah. about something else, but wait. A little bit of a follow-up on the actor network theory parallel is that I think you're right, Hector, that in my mind, the way I thought about actor network theory and its relation to the kind of work that Bernard Luckman are doing here is it's actually quite consistent and it's not that difficult to incorporate. Um, and the parts of Latour that I find the most useful in thinking you know, sort of thinking uh, with Berger and Luckman, but through Latour is the empirical parts, how he shows the knowledge being constructed, the, how facts get constructed. It seems to me that what Actor Network does in a really nice way, where I would say it adds something to what Berger and Luckman have done, is it multiplies the verbs that we use to describe the constructing, that we've sort of worn out this verb constructing, <laughs> um, and and it's been it's been abused, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I think Latour and others in that genre are quite good and interesting and lively in the verbs they're using to describe the action, whether it's choreography or um, um, assembling, right? Mm -hmm. the, the the you know they're they're not interested in the network in the way that we think of the sort of organizational theorists being interested in the network, they're interested in the work of the net, right? Um, always returning to that sort of pragmatist vein here of, of what is the social action that's going on that's producing this conceptualization of reality or the fact. So I think that's where, to me, actor network theory is quite useful. Um, we get a lot of good verbs. <laughs> Returning to what, to what you just raised, um, I think what I what I take from what you said is is that in addition to you know not rather than just saying something is socially constructed to have to be able to demonstrate alternate possible right alternate possible constructions alternate possible arrangements you know in my terminology of relevance and irrelevance that would produce a different right a different reality or a different you know version of the thing that's in question um, and also to be able to show the limitations right of of the current construction what are what's the what are the things that it obscures um, in addition to the things that it makes possible? What are the things we can't recognize when we, when we look at it in this one particular way? So I actually think that you know, what you've said goes, is, is very important um, in my thinking about social construction, in addition to trying to think about how this actually happens, but how, what are alternate possibilities that are obscured by the way that something is currently right, thought about or experienced? So I, actually, I think those are two very important points. Mm -hmm. I'm also going to that. There is a line in the in the Lockman uh, video where he said that one of the parts of the reception of the book that has been lost is like the, the importance that they give it to the previous construction, what what he calls tradition, uh, the, the the weight of previous construction in today's construction. So probably that goes to the contingency part that is is limited because of that. Right. I, I want to return. No, it's not. It's not about that. So, so I want to return to my land, the soup. I'm looking at the table of contents of this last book of Berger, and I'm thinking, this guy now in his 80s, this is 50 years after he wrote the, or co-wrote the social... Yeah, probably 50 years after he wrote it. Yes, <laughs> this is the, the social construct of reality. And the chapters are the pluralist phenomenon, pluralism in the individual faith, the pluralism in religious institutions, and political management of pluralism, and what I'm, talk, what I'm talking about, the greatness of that book that I think has been missed in sociology, is the epistemic pluralism. The fact that you can actually blend. One of the things that, that I like to do in teaching theory, and I've done it so many years, is to spend a lot of time on theories that are very different from one another, to to remove that idea that you have to cling to a particular favorite, whether it's Freud or Marx or Weber, whoever, to be able to actually work with theories that are not necessarily... I spent almost half the course in classical theory on Durkheim and Zimmel, not just because they are so fantastic, which they are, but also because they are so different from one another. And I want someone to be able to 
think in a Durkheimian way and a Zimmerian way, because if you can do that, you can do anything. And what the social construction of reality demonstrates unbelievably. You know, I, I remember that when I first read it, in the first few years after that, I didn't appreciate this element at all. What I thought was that that discovered for me, to me, discovered Schultz, because I didn't know about Schultz. And then I got it from Garfinkel too. Uh, and actually what Luckman didn't say about his own work, which is fantastic, is that he made the, he made the very chaotic writings of Schultz that were unpublished, put them together in the, in the structures of the life world, which is a masterpiece too. But the idea that to, to appreciate the fact that you can have these different theorists, and again, you know, big distinction between micro and macro. And still, they are dealing with Durkheim, king of macro supposedly, and Mead, and Schultz, and are not contradictory. They are, they are in the same soup. So, enough said. But just to uh, uh, say a little bit more, even if there were enough was said, uh, uh, you know, I, I actually, uh, when I teach the, the basic, the, the classical theory course, I identify myself as a principled eclectic, <laughs> and, 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 and the, you know, as not just eclectic uh, by custom, but it, it yeah. by commitment, and I think that that's really one of the great things about, about this work, and. Um, I'm and not sure that the, the the man who spoke to us uh, yeah. on uh, uh, via Skype uh, is actually true to that position. I, I don't know yeah. if they appreciated it themselves. Right. I yeah. just think that one of the great things that they take from that book is the ability to think flexibly. Yeah. And, and actually, the, the, an interesting thing about reading his um, his memoir. Uh, and now I'm kind of going to pat myself on the back as a representative of the new school, is that he gives an account mm -hmm. of, uh, of this eclecticism mm -hmm. as having to do with his relationship with three different new school professors, Albert, and Solomon, Schutz, and who am I missing? Kyle Meyer. Kyle Meyer, right. right. And, and, and it, 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 in, the, that open, in the opening of it, which by the way you can read on Amazon, uh, uh, they give that to you. Uh, uh, he just gives accounts of taking courses with these three different men, and and, and indicates that his, uh, you know, they shaped his uh, his fundamental perspective on the world, and I would say fundamental perspective that uh, is revealed in the social construction of reality, and and uh, as a matter of just taking three different courses, yeah. you know, it, it recognizes just a, a lived experience. Yeah. Right? Like, Really fascinating. So, so uh, when I first met him, and I, he said something about his being a Lutheran, and I was quite astounded. And I said, "How do you?" And he said, "He's a believer." And I said, "How do you reconcile it with writing social construction theology and the sacred canopy?" And he said, "I just switch hats," right. <laughs> which is exactly the pluralism right, that he talks right. about. Yeah, that's right. It, it also, in, in tribute to the man. He has an incredible uh, 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 sense of irony and humor, you know, s s s s and, and I think that that actually empowers, uh, it empowered the, er the early work. You know, it's just incredible. He's written marvelous things about comedy, and you know, uh, and and he's funny. Yeah. <laughs> he's a great model to how to think in one's eighties. <laughs> I'm looking for such role models. Um, I was hoping that you could expand a little bit more on the less real and uh, like parapsychology. Something, I mean, religion I see, but I was curious if you could expand more on that. Well, uh, I'm thinking the work that I'm thinking of there is Harry Collins, uh, who's done work on sort of why is it the parapsychology, though, adopting a lot of the idiom of uh, rational science isn't accepted as a rational science. Um, it's, all I can say about parapsychology. I mean, it's sort of an example, I think. But was there something specific that you meant by that? Or no, I just in in, in your in your research and your experience, there's something specific. Because well, a lot I of mean, your presentations. You know, my sort of way thing. into this in this paper mm -hmm. is not the way in is to say that um, you know, with Schutz and Berger and Luckman and lots of the methodological tradition, 
the focus is on there's this sort of paramount reality from which other things deviate, like parapsychology or paranormal activity. And then the question is, why aren't those things considered real, right? Mm -hmm. um, and my thing, uh, what I'm saying is just, um, it's really kind of an empirical twist is to say, well, that's fine. That's one way of studying the social construction of reality. But let's look at some things that aren't deviations but happen in every day in our everyday life. You know, we oscillate in between this sort of sense of this is kind of real and this is sort of not real. And what we do that I find interesting is that we, um, uh, much like what the ethnomethodologists talk about as a hidden curriculum, we systematically hide that, right? So for just to give you a, a very local example, um, I, and I'm guessing the rest of the panelists here, spend a lot of time preparing these talks, <laughs> right? Um, none of it is really, in my own mind, in sensibility, real in the sense that what it was preparing for was to get to talk today, right? Um, nonetheless, I spent, and we all probably did, much more time on that than we actually did in the 15 minutes that we had, right? Um, that's kind of interesting, and so it's kind of recovering that social work that goes on in preparing for things, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. I find the term paranormal fantastically interesting. To me, it goes together with the, the term un-American. What's paranormal? These prefixes that exclude things from the mark, from the unmarked, very interesting. Mm -hmm. What is psychological? I mean, the term parapsychology implies that we all know what the psychological is, which I don't think we do. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking that that's not a bad place to end. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.